Hello, and welcome to today's virtual Hinckley Forum. The Hinckley Institute of Politics is a nonpartisan institute at the University of Utah. The Hinckley provides an array of transformative experiences for students through internships, forums, and classes. Hinckley Forums seek to foster public discourse and civil debate on the most current and pressing issues, bringing in local, national, and international thought leaders. We would like to thank our streaming sponsor, AARP Utah, for making our virtual forums this fall possible. We would also like to thank our media sponsor, KCPW, for recording and rebroadcasting forums as part of the Hinckley Radio Hour. Today's forum is Constitution Day, Towards a More Perfect Union. We are joined by guest speaker, Timothy Shriver. Dr. Shriver is chair of the Special Olympics International Board of Directors and founder of UNITE, an, initi an initiative to promote national unity and solidarity across differences. Shriver earned his undergraduate degree from Yale University, a master's degree from Catholic University, and a doctor in education from the University of Connecticut. If you have questions for our speaker, please enter them into the YouTube chat. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, and thank you all for joining. And uh, thank you to the Hinckley Institute, to the sponsors, uh, to all those who have contributed to inviting me to be part of this conversation on Constitution Day as we think about a more perfect union. It seems to me almost uh, essential uh, that we focus and delve deeply into this question of union uh, and a more perfect union. I don't think there's an American alive today who wouldn't say that we are, we've got to get better. Um, and while we may disagree on exactly what we need to do to get better or who needs to help us get better or what kinds of solutions are required to become a more perfect union, I think we're all on the same page that there is an urgency uh, to the defense, to the protection, to the sustaining of our union that we get better and closer to more perfect. And so I'm honored to be a part of this conversation and invite uh, all of you as, as the chat allows and as YouTube allows to participate in it both during this hour, but also uh, well beyond it. I'm gonna now see if I can share my screen and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. It's not working, I don't see it. Oh, there, no, let's see. Hold on just a second and see if I can make this work. Uh, give me one sec here, gang, and there we go. Share we go. Okay, I'm gonna start with this photograph. Um, some of you may uh, have seen it. Uh, it was taken from the orbiting capsule, the orbiting uh, uh, rocket ship, the orbiting uh, uh, human uh, uh, spaceship that was uh, going around the moon in preparation for the lunar landings. Um, it was taken at a moment when the astronauts themselves, as they took it, thought, wow, this image will change humanity because we'll see this view, this view of a, of a planet that's undivided, that has no uh, barriers of geography or race or culture or ethnicity or religion or history, that we'll see how beautiful our little small fragile planet is, how vast the universe is that surrounds us, that we're suspended in. It will change us. Well, alas, uh, in the late 1960s, this picture emerged, and here we are, still struggling to understand, in my view, its lessons. And we have Dr. King's words here on this slide to also, I hope, challenge us. Uh, his message uh, in, in this same window of time, a few years earlier, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So, you're all leaders, students, professors, scholars, thinking about political systems, thinking about structures, thinking about our constitution, thinking about our union. I invite you also now to think about the hearts and minds that are required, that are necessary in this moment to help us lean into the more perfect side of our union. And isn't it possible that in your own lives, you know, you felt, you remember a moment when love drove out hate, when light drove out darkness. And that in that moment, the mindset, the heart set, if I can put it that way, uh, the orientation that you saw, maybe you saw it this morning and someone in your family, maybe you saw it 
driving down the street one day. Maybe you saw it in a moment of crisis or tension. Maybe you've heard it or felt this kind of energy in a moment of grief or in a moment of supporting someone else in their grief. But I think all of us know it. We feel it. We've recognized it. We, were, we have been a part of the energy of light and love, but so often we can't bring it to scale. We can't make it our daily practice. So I want to invite you right now to think of a moment and carry it through this presentation if you can. Uh, the texture, the moment, the time, the face, the person who inspired you to believe that indeed love and light can overcome the, divi the division, the hatred, the darkness that so many of us feel in our country today. So if we th think to ourselves, uh, what's the definition of uh, where we are right now? Uh, this is old news, but it's important to contextualize this conversation as we think about a more perfect union in where we are. We are, by almost every estimation, a house divided. I mean, we don't agree on much as a country, but we agree that we're divided. Um, and we also know, whether by ancient religious wisdom or political insight or structural in, uh, understandings of political institutions, a house divided cannot stand. So we are stuck and we are sick. We are anxious. We are afraid. We are depressed in greater numbers, it seems, than ever. We are ending relationships, um, breaking down, uh, even at a very personal level within our own families, uh, refusing to talk, connect. Uh, engage with each other, not to mention within our workplaces. We are uh, on the verge of what most people would say is the worst or in the midst of the worst moment, the lowest point in the history of the United States of America. That's pretty sobering. And if the mountain wasn't high enough from all this, just think about the result of this sickness and stuckness in our children in the despair and the anxiety in this moment of pandemic as people try to go back to school and try to figure out what, what's safe and what isn't, can't trust anyone. Uh, uh, that if this broader brush strokes of division weren't bad enough, even now it's made it even worse and in some senses terrifyingly worse to almost all, all of us. When we think about uh, this, I, I think of a story uh, that comes from the world of Special Olympics. And, you know, in this scene, you, you see a full stadium. These were, you know, this might look anachronistic to, 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 to many of you, but this is the uh, a Yale Bowl uh, for the opening ceremonies of the 1995 Special Olympics World Games. So down on the field, you've got 6,000 people with an intellectual disability, all of them from all over the world, 135 or so countries in this at this moment. And you have President Clinton, you can see in the uh, right-hand side. You can see him on the jumbotron. He was actually at the stadium uh, as president to open these games, but they wouldn't let him go down on the field because of, for security reasons. So he was at the top of the stadium uh, delivering his remarks uh, well above the crowd. Down on the field, all the athletes had been given cameras. In the 90s, we had cameras. So everybody got a single-use camera as a gift. And one of the photographers looked over at one of the delegations uh, he thought from an African country, they had beautiful uh, uh, outfits uh, that uh, spoke of, uh, of, a, of a West African nation. And he didn't know where they were from or if they spoke English, but he noticed that they were all trying to get a picture of the president at the top of the stadium. But they all had their cameras backwards. The lens was pointing on their nose. And he went over to tell them, you're, you're wasting all your film. You know, he, he didn't know if they could understand. You have to turn the camera around. And one of the athletes turned to him and said, oh, thank you. He said, but if you look through the viewfinder backwards, this little camera works like binoculars and you can see President Clinton perfectly clearly. Do you want to try? Now, I love this story because it speaks to such a fundamental pattern in human interaction. The photographer looked at the athletes and he saw what? He saw people with a disability. He assumed they didn't know what they were doing. They, they couldn't know what they were doing. They've never, I mean, imagine the narrative in his head. They don't, they've never used a camera before. This is what's all going on in his head. Now, mind you, he is proud, was proud to tell this story. He's not ashamed. He was only ashamed of the fact that he so badly misjudged each other. We do this all the time. We judge each other by labels, by names 
by identities and we get each other wrong. The athletes were creative, entrepreneurial, in almost uh, uh, coming up with a solution to a problem no one could have imagined. I can't see the president, let's figure this out. But the photographer, the professional saw this. He assumed they were incompetent. Think about it. In your classes, in your faculty meetings, how many times do you look across the table at your kitchen table and get each other wrong? Some of the labeling is responsible for this, but some of it's just profound misunderstandings we have of each other, the absence of common languages. And right now our country is in a sense, all of us are getting each other wrong because we've lost in my view, the essential ingredient to common understandings, to common purpose, to common, if you will, hopes and dreams, shared meaning. The institutions, uh, the patterns that cultivated shared meaning, small businesses, religious organizations, long-term business uh, employment relationships, uh, small towns, all political parties even, all these things that traditionally allowed people to weave an identity that nested them together, nested us together. Uh, maybe not as a whole, but nested us into our smaller units of meaning and purpose where we could work together. Almost all of them are weakened today. Uh, but it's not just the weakening of those institutions, those gut checks, those counterbalances, those places where we go for a sense of safety, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. But look what happens when, as a result of that. Individualism taken to an extreme becomes, uh, it's all about me. Uh, when it's all about me, uh, my version of truth is my version of truth. You can have your own, I, I don't buy it. Uh, and therefore you get fake news, right? Because I don't trust your authority figures. I don't trust your version. Uh, I got my own. Uh, I don't have faith in a higher purpose. I don't believe what you believe in. So we don't have a common belief set. Uh, uh, whatever you construct as private me as meaning, that's yours. It's not mine. We don't have a shared sense of destiny. And then this last bullet point, I just want to dwell on just for a moment, because what happens when all of this becomes, in a sense, a fragile is the way I'll put it is when you get into a bind, when we get into binds, rather than having the tools to process pain, frustration, inequality, we blame people for it, right? This, isn't, this, is, this goes all the way back to biblical language. We find a scapegoat and we blame the scapegoat. And we find a way to unite by saying what? It's the other guy that caused the problem. And today we have a country in which all of us Republicans, Democrats, black, white, rich, poor. I don't mean we all are equally responsible for the problems, but we're all equally responsible or complicit, I believe, in scapegoating each other and believing that scapegoating will lead to a solution. My premise is, I don't think so. Here's the simple way of making this point uh, in just one image. Um, we're looking at the same reality, but we see two different things. And if I could uh, get a show of hands, about what you see, my guess is about half of us will say, oh, I see the rabbit. And then other half of us will say, I don't see a rabbit, I see a duck, I see a bird. And even though this is kind of silly, uh, I would offer to you that some of you who see either a rabbit or a bird can't see the other one. You, you, most of us can you know, find a way to, but sometimes even when I look at this, I'm like, wait a second, I can't see the rabbit. Oh, oh wait a second, there's the rabbit. Uh, but um, but we're looking at the same reality, the United States of America, but we're, we're seeing uh, two, if not more than two, radically different realities. Uh, and here's maybe the last point I want to make at the generic level. There are people who profit from continuing to tell each of us that the other is a threat. Uh, we know that those who are most active in politics and spend more time in cable news and talk radio are more likely to be angry and, divide, uh, and de in despair. So there's a relationship between how much media you consume and how politically active you are and how 
uh, despairing you are about the future and about your fellow Americans. What's that tell you? That what they're pumping into us, all of us, all sides here, no, I'm not taking any point of view on the partisan side of things. Uh, we're all getting fed the fear that draws us back to the politician or to the media outlet that will help assuage the fear, but at the same time remind us that we should be afraid. Uh, one of our colleagues, Arthur Brooks, sometimes called this the outrage industrial complex. Uh, it's a lot of people who profit from making us think, whether it's true or not, that other Americans are the enemy. Uh, I'm going to skip this boring story because I'm going to get to the point where I, where I hope we, we can focus on a little bit on solutions. So we, our polling suggests that there's a group we're calling the exhausted majority. Uh, this is somewhere between 60 and 70% of Americans who say, in effect, they don't like the way things are. They want them to change, but they don't know how. They don't like the anger, the anxiety. They especially don't like the disrespect they feel, all sides here, from the other side. They want it to change, they don't know how. But if you drill in, when we drill in, when I've drilled in with my team and with many, many, many uh, people like uh, those of you in, 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 the, in the academy, we summarize this by saying what they really want is a United States. And for many, the insight is actually maybe we've never had it. We've had states, we've had America, but we have maybe never really had the United States. So what could we do? Uh, here we sit not to just diagnose problems, but to, uh, at least in our view, try to come up with something concrete to build from this structure of broken meaning, I dare say almost a spiritual crisis. What can we do to reduce the anxiety and the divisiveness, the loneliness, which is at an epidemic level for our children, for ourselves, or for our country? Uh, so I'm gonna suggest and this is a work in progress, so feel free. Uh, I know all those of you who are in the academy take pot shots at, at ideas. That's, that's part of the great uh, gift of being able to, uh, to be in the academy is to, is to really test and press, press, press hard on ideas to see if you agree with them, see if they hold up to the evidence. Uh, we're offering th this uh, for your consideration. We need a new mindset. And this builds on the Einstein uh, insight that you can't solve new problems with the mindset that created them. Uh, we think the new mindset is best described as the uniter. And so we ask ourselves three questions. Uh, well, we actually asked four questions, three on this slide. The first question is, is there such a thing? And I'll presume, but I try to make the case that yes, there is, it's already in our culture, uh, the uniters. Uh, then we ask ourselves three additional questions. What are the skills? that uniters need and have? What are the stories we need to tell each other about who we are that actually tell the story of the uniters, not the dividers? We have the outrage industrial complex telling us the story of the dividers. Maybe we need a new platform to tell us the stories of the uniters. And what are the solutions that are possible to big problems, political, social, cultural solutions, not talk, solutions, that can come from uniters if they're marshaled and allowed to do the work together. Let me try to take each of these on quickly. So first, the skills. So this is a question uh, that uh, I would ask uh, any of you who have familiarity with a five or six year old, you sent them to school or you maybe you can remember going to school and if someone had drawn two shapes uh, and said to you, what's the difference between these two shapes? And if I were to say to you today, in the eyes of a five-year-old, what's the difference between these two shapes to a five-year-old? So you can look and say, well, one's thin, one's fat, one's squiggly, one's got straight lines. No, here's, here's the answer. The difference between these two shapes is that shape one has an adult, a teacher or a parent, has an adult that wants the child to know its meaning. So the reason children learn the meaning of shape one is because an adult wants them to learn the meaning, an adult who is important and valuable to the child. The child learns in and through and because of the relationship with an adult. Now I say this around skills because fundamentally, 
we have broken relationships. And fundamentally, we're going to have to learn a new art, new skills to strengthen relationships, maybe slowly, maybe one at a time. But we're going to have to focus on the lifeblood of motivation and desire and purpose, which is our relationships. What are some of the skills we teach now kindergartners or third graders or sixth graders to help strengthen their relationships internally and between themselves and with the larger world that we know now can actually make a difference? Here's, here's the menu, if you will, of relationships. We call this in the field of education, social and emotional learning. But you could do a shortcut here and say, what are the strategies and skills that we need as a country to overcome division? And you'd find, I think, that the pie slices in the middle of this diagram, self-awareness, self-management, relationship skills, and social awareness, and responsible decision-making, we don't have these skills as a culture. We may have a lot of self-improvement strategies, but we don't have an us improvement strategy for learning the skills for us improvement that would allow us, in my view, to overcome these fears. So we're pulling from the uh, great gifts that many educators have put together, psychologists, social workers, teachers, parents, to build this platform for schools and said, well, what are, what are some of the ones we could use in state houses? or in executive offices, or in courts, uh, or in city halls. Here's one, uh, almost any mayor, governor, president could use, turtle, the turtle skill. When you have a problem, when you feel angry, when you feel your stress thermometers going up, put your arms on your shoulders, cross your arms, draw yourself inward into your shell, and stop the stress from rising and remind yourself that you can take a deep breath and solve the problem peaceably, peaceably. So just take, we don't have time for a lot of this, but take one deep, if, you, if you're comfortable, put your arms on your shoulders, draw your head into your shoulders like a turtle, take a deep breath, Imagine yourself in the midst of a problem, maybe you're in one right now, and say to yourself, I can calm down, I'm okay. I can think of solutions. Now, some of you are thinking, are you freaking kidding me? I'm watching some guy turtle, and we're talking about the problems of the country. And some of you, I hope, are thinking, Oh my goodness, that's something six-year-olds are being taught to do. Why isn't that part of how we treat each other at work and in government and in politics? And what a difference might it make if we had this kind of lesson? Here's another one. This is taught to high school students, how to disagree without being disagreeable. Novel, right? What an, what an extraordinary idea. How to disagree without being disagreeable. How could we learn this? We can learn it through history. We can study Lincoln's remarks and comments, and we can remember that he said, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. Not I must get to crush and defeat him. Or, I must get to uh, show everyone how disgusting uh, that person is or how reprehensible that party is or how immoral that group is or how uh, outrageous that position is. No, I must get to know him better. And if you look at the right side of the screen, you'll see these are taught skills now. This is not uh, just look at it and learn it. You can actually sit down and practice these skills with kids and you'd be stunned at how quickly and how decisively learning a few small steps can result in major uh, changes and outcomes. How about just number two on the five strategies for collaborating effectively? Try this for the next 24 hours. Every discussion you get in, uh, Try consciously remembering for a moment that you're going to presume positive intent on the part of the other person. And when the person says something that you know full well is not positive, try imagining it might be coming from a positive place. Just, just practice this and imagine these skills translated into 
cultural skills, institutional skills, organizational skills, community-based organization skills. So that's a little bit of the skill framework. We're working very hard to build the skills for the uniter. And let me shift now to the stories. Remember, skills, stories, solutions. What would it look like if there were uh, a network or a show or live streams where the question wasn't who hates who or who beat up who or who's angry at who, but actually who solved great problems by finding new extraordinary ways to do it? Our little team put together uh, a show. It was a 24 hour live stream. I'm guessing most of you didn't see it, but you can watch almost all of it on the web, even now at unite.us. I'm gonna just show you the highlight reel and look here to notice if there are people that end up on just this little three minute version that you think to yourself uh, almost viscerally, I don't like that guy, or I don't agree with her or him. And if I can invite you to do this, let that thought go and just take them for what they're offering on the screen. Let, let's see if I can make this work uh, with the video. Hold on just a sec. And let me see if, so I'm gonna ask Tammy, is that coming through? Not yet. We just see the, your slide, your PowerPoint slide. I don't see the video yet. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop the share and then I'm gonna start again and see if I can do this this way. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, let's see if we don't you get hear this. it. We don't hear it, but we I see haven't it. started it yet. Let me okay. start it. Yeah, hi, how are you? <laughs> super. My name is Archbishop Tabo Makobam, joining this call to unite from Cape Town in South Africa. I am so privileged to be with you here in Montgomery, Alabama. We're coming to you from Manila, Philippines. I am joining the call to unite to bring the joy of story time to children around the world. My call is to make sure that we unite people by Beating them. I've been doing my best to spread positivity. Develop the skills of empathy and compassion. Take a stand for those who need help the most. Slow down our own breath, our own being, our own body in this particular moment. Hundreds of millions of families across the world find themselves at some of the lowest points that they've ever seen. We're united in grief. We're united in horror. And while we're all suffering in our own unique capacity, we need not suffer alone. In the face of our pain, we must not forfeit our dignity. We are aware now as we have never been before. This is the perfect opportunity for us to do what we're doing right now, to reach out, to bring people together. I think of it as a massive reset for the world. We certainly need a new normal. The question really is, what type of normal do we want to get back to? When we come together like this, it gives us the greatest opportunity to shift the way the world looks today into really a reimagine what the world will look like tomorrow. People are capable of making huge, radical behavioral changes when they're motivated. We don't have to wait until the pandemic is over to unite. You know, this dream could come true right now. We have a simple principle as uniters. We believe that we are one. Mothers and fathers, all kinds of monks, musicians, dancers, and all the gifts that humanity has to offer. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. There's no time for love like now. This is the calling that we all are being urged to answer. This is who we are. Each of us at this moment needs to be a leader, a leader in our personal life, a leader in our communities, and a leader in the world. May we all find our interconnectedness. Our place in humanity. We rise or fall together, and we are determined to rise. The most powerful force in the world is the individual who has realized their power to do good. We're not just doing it for ourselves, but we're doing it for the sake of the entire planet. Together, we can be able to walk this path towards healing. 
I encourage our global community to answer the call for someone else by giving and volunteering. Not just calling for unity, but take action. Take action right here and right now. We have to do more. So we have to act as one. We have to unite in common purpose. So join us in service, in generosity, in sharing your ideas. And when you hear the call, answer. Here I am. Send me. So let me see if I can get out of that and bring you back to the slides just a sec. Getting good at this, Tammy. You're going to be impressed. I, so, I'm, not, I'm going to be out of a job. <laughs> so um, let's see. Can you hear that music? Yes, we can. Uh oh. Okay, hold on. Let me just see if I can figure out how to get rid of that. Wait a minute. <laughs> Just when I thought I had it, hold on. Give me a second here. Get rid of that. Boom, okay. All right, so uh, remember, a new mindset, skills, stories. Now, whatever your reaction to that short highlight reel is or was, I hope one thing was clear, which is that this could be really powerful storytelling, not just glib, do-gooder stuff, but powerful, visceral, emotional media content that if you watched that every night, I dare say, I'm gonna be arrogant here, instead of what you currently watch, <laughs> even if you like what you currently watch, I'm not picking on anybody's media choices. I'm just saying, if part of what our collective storytelling included was the joining of forces to tell the stories of what we have in common in creative and powerful ways, I think we'd have an extraordinary shift in self-definition and therefore an extraordinary boost in our capacity to do what we said on the last slide, which is to presume positive intent on each other and find creative solutions. Now there's more, so there's more to storytelling than simply, I'd say, uh, let me see if I can, why is that not going for, oh, there we go. Uh, let's talk about solutions. Uh, remember, skills, stories, solutions. Now, in just a matter of five months, our small organization has been inviting people to come together across divides when big problems come up and say, let's try working together, not to split the difference, but to come up with a creative solution that no one's thought of. And this little slide here, they can't see the slide. Yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and pop your slide back up now. Oh, I didn't share it, sorry. Say share screen, boom, share. Okay, can you see that? I think we're in. Can. Okay, so I won't go through these, but these are five projects, all of which have been birthed in the last four months. Uh, the Call to Unite, you just saw a media property project reset, which is focused on criminal justice reform, the COVID collaborative, which is working with governors uh, and, uh, healthcare institutions and uh, schools of public health and uh, uh, federal and, and local epidemiologists to try to create a consensus uh, outlet for people to focus on what we know and what we can do about COVID, get out of the partisan stuff. The Purpose Party, which is a young person's attempt to kind of do uh, on the ground, uh, purpose solution generating parties, disc jockeys, laughter, fun, convening, celebrations with a purpose and act now, uh, I'm sorry, act now is criminal justice project reset is on civics. Now, here's the point, not to take in all these things separately. It's just to say that in a short period of time, asking people to lay down their swords, presume positive intent and work together has unleashed a pretty powerful, if, uh, if I can be so arrogant as to say, a pretty powerful, groundswell of energy to solve big problems, but to solve them in a way that finds solutions nobody's seen because nobody's imagined that there's a solution that brings us all together. We've only imagined the solutions that are oppositional. So, can't seem to get this to work, there we go. Let me give you one last solution. Uh, it comes out of my own experience. This is a picture of my mom. 
uh, when she was young. My mom died uh, a little over 10 years ago, but this is when she was in her 20s. And she's with her sister. Uh, her sister had an intellectual disability. I bring this up because this, for her, was a formational time in her life when she, my mother, came to understand that the world wanted to divide her from her own sister. That the world saw her sister as less than, different, other, that in most places, her own sister would have been put into an institution because she was too different to belong. You notice the rhetoric, the, the language? She's too different to belong. She is too much outside the circle of the normal, the acceptable. We have to get rid of her. This would have been not an outlier point of view, but the normative point of view for people with an intellectual disability. But what does this picture tell you? There was two people there who just loved each other. Now that relationship, here's uh, another picture of my aunt Rosemary with her brother. Uh, again, young people, happy. Uh, Rosemary uh, would end up being a person I'm guessing none of you have ever heard of. Uh, and rightfully so, it's not an accusation. Uh, the guy on the left, you probably have heard of. He probably 20 years after this picture is taken becomes the president of the United States of America, arguably the most powerful person on earth. And she arguably the most powerless person on earth. But in this picture, you know that they both understood something other than the power dynamic, other than the cultural dynamic, other than the dynamic that says you're too other to belong. Here in this picture, they trusted each other. They loved each other. They were in it together. And when he becomes president, what people most remember, Republicans or Democrats and not partisan here, is the simple words, don't ask what someone can do for you. Don't ask what the country can do for you. Ask what you can give. Because why? He understood, in my view, at a visceral level that when you give yourself to others, even in trust, even in reckless moral courage, even when you're not sure it's gonna be returned, when you give yourself, uh, you get your best self back. That movement this, that these siblings created ends up being the Special Olympics movement. And from this moment, um, I don't know if we have time, Tammy, for this video. Let me stop here just to check. Uh, do we yes. have a? We, uh -huh. we have, yep, we do. Okay, so let me let me let me let me, let me just introduce this video uh, because remember when I talked about skills and I've talked about stories and I've talked about solutions, I think you'll see in this video. I'm hoping you'll see the skills of a uniter, the storytelling power of uniters, and a solution for a high school in the United States of America in the year 2020. So hopefully uh, look for these and let me know. We, you can tell me in the questions whether I've sold the, you a bill of goods here or whether you can begin to see how powerful this new mindset can be. This was made by students at a high school in Rhode Island, Ponagansett High School last year. Penguin? Penguin? Patriots. <laughs> Patriots, there we go. Yeah, Jason loves sports. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Jay loves the Patriots. Who who you like? Gronk? Say it. Gronk. Gronk. Everyone's curious, like living with a person with like disabilities, like how daily life is, and I say, I don't know, just normal. You good? All right. Have a good day. All right? Be a, be a good boy, right? I am. I know you are. It's like a normal brother relationship. We fight a lot. And we also have great moments together. It's, it's great. It's life. You know, I think that when you talk about Evan and Jay, you talk about, you know, they're really one person here. It's not Evan, it's not Jay, it's Evan and Jay. Jay's just like, Big ball of joy. A student who typically you wouldn't hear much communication from, but when you do hear it from him, you feel it. 
He greets you in the morning when you walk in. He wants to get up and make sure everybody's smiling and having a good time. So he may go by you, tap you on the shoulder. He may make a silly face. Who's on your basketball team? Evan. Evan. Who's he again? My brother? I'm a brother. My brother. Evan and Jer instrumental in our inclusion movement. Um, Evan O'Hallberg alone is the dream for a teacher. Programs like TOPS, Special Olympics, and most recently Unified Sports have provided a foundation for individuals of all abilities to express themselves and succeed in society. You don't really know until you're up there and that your heart's pounding knowing that you have to like give this page and a half long speech in front of everyone. I know that when I graduate from high school, I will miss the times I've spent with my brother. Even the little things, like car rides at school, with the radio booming, and I'm dancing in the back seat. I started like sobbing a little bit, and then Jay put his arm around me, and then after that I knew I was kind of like done. But I'm, I remember that I'm talking in front of the entire school and I'm on TV, so I had to keep going. Making a contribution to a huge movement is the biggest thing anyone can really do. It feels, it feels humbling. For this is why I choose to include. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> Through sports like Unified, I can trust everyone to protect my brother because they know that he's no different than anyone else. Brings like no greater joy. Yeah. So, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you see the skills that those young men, Evan and Jay, have learned? Uh, how to be an includer? the slogans I choose to include, the lessons that inclusion is an action of head and heart. Did you hear the storytelling? Did you see the assembly? Do you see the large groups of people who are defining their school with a new school pledge that talks about being uh, choosing to include? And did you see a solution to a problem in American education, bullying, isolation, exclusion, despair, depression? Did you see a whole school that's united as these young people are in recommitting themselves to each other, to their own learning, to their own sense of purpose? Did you notice the thread in there that allows for the hope and dream that test scores will go up and college acceptance rates will go up and all that will go up? This is not just the skills or the stories, but also the solutions. But these are all nested in and dependent upon a world of just us. You can't get there if it's them against us. Just can't get there. Just won't work. So this is what we think Uniters believe. Uh, I invite you to take this as maybe a checklist. Uh, maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't. We believe everyone belongs. We believe that mutual respect is something we're all starving for and it matters more than anything right now. It, I don't care what you think about the political debates or the election or where we're headed. We believe that mutual respect matters most. Uh, we believe there is no dichotomy between peace and justice, that we get to peace through justice and we get to justice through peace. That people that wanna pull those apart are missing the point. We believe that solutions come from the creative energies of all experiences and exposures. Personal responsibility matters. So does social responsibility. We believe actually unashamedly, unapologetically that America has the hope of coming together, even though it doesn't look great sometimes. We believe the solution is that we can come together, that it's gonna take practices and skills and training and new institutions and new patterns. I mean, uh, our colleague Yuval Levin has written about institutions, the breakdown, the need for the trust in institutions. We believe that, but it's going to take practice. 
to find the new patterns that will allow us to join into institutions that bring us together rather than those that unite that divide us. Um, and we believe we're stronger when we're all included. Not some, not 51%, not 50% plus one, not that our ratings go higher than yours, but when everyone's included. We think the culture is asking for this. This is, you know, this is pop culture, Pharrell Williams. I'm telling you, he said, the world's a beautiful place, but it doesn't work without what? Skills, empathy, and inclusion. He nails it right at the outset. Take what you, whatever language you use for the divine, he, he, he names it love. Universe, he's saying, cosmic statement of how this all fits together. The universe is love. It's the only way it functions. Divisive stuff works. We get it. Yeah, you can tell me that's really nice, but I'm telling you what's going to work to get my candidate elected. It's to divide. It works to divide. Yeah, we get it. Uh, but you have to choose what side you're on. For Pharrell, it's I'm choosing empathy, I'm choosing inclusion, I'm choosing love for everybody, just trying to lift everyone. Even when I disagree with someone, I'm wishing them the best and hoping for the best because we can't win the other way. So I want to close with asking you the question, maybe coming back to the beginning, you, I hope, remembered a moment, uh, imagined a moment of love and light in the face of hatred and darkness. Um, are you willing? I mean, it's tough. This is not an easy question. Are you willing to take a chance as a uniter to try a new mindset, to join those who are already working with this new mindset? Name it what you will. I'm not about brands, but we are collectively about uh, making a difference. Uh, are you willing to focus on the leadership skills that are centered in love and light? A lot of leadership training isn't. It's just not. Uh, are you willing to believe that we're one? A lot of people say, no, it's not true. We're very different. We're very divided. We're, we have oppositional energies. We have oppositional goals. We don't all want the same thing. It's a win-lose world. We don't agree with that. We believe we're one. And we believe, as Dr. King said uh, at a similar time when he said the words about love and light, uh, tomorrow's now. We have and are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. There is no time to waste. Uh, our country, if you trust either my gut or the data, the future of our country is hanging in the balance. Uh, the, in our view, at least, the win-lose world has run out of gas. We need uh, neither apathy nor complacency, but urgency in pursuing the world of Unite. So I'll leave you with one last story, uh, a role model of mine in this picture, Scarlett Lewis. She's in this picture with her little boy, Jesse. Um, it's the kind of picture everybody likes to have around the house. Uh, Jesse when he was just six. Uh, sadly, however, Jesse never lived past the age of six. He was murdered at Sandy Hook Elementary School shortly after this picture was taken. Scarlett uh, could have descended into an us versus them world, could have gotten torn apart by anger and revenge, uh, by politics even, and by the dividers who wanted to use her on one side or another of a political debate, she instead has decided to commit herself to educating children in her new curriculum. It's called the Choose Love Curriculum. She's dedicated it to Jesse. And with all her heart and soul, she believes he is the guiding light of the Choose Love Curriculum. It's going all over the country. Teachers are using it. It's powerful. She also dedicates it to Adam Lanza. Adam Lanza, who snuffed out her dear little boy's life. Because she believes that if Adam Lanza had had a choose love curriculum, a school, a community, a culture, maybe her little boy would still be alive. There's a lot of, tragically, Jesse's in the world, even today, Thousands of Americans will be hurt by violence. 
millions of us will be wounded by despair and anger, frustration, disappointment, anxiety. Millions of us will lie in bed tonight unable to sleep because we're worried about each other, about the future. Can we get there? Uh, if you're in any of those camps, I invite you to just when, the, when you close your eyes, imagine Scarlett uh, and maybe write her a note or visit her website if you're into that. But in any event, trust that even in the most despairing of circumstances, it is possible. And in fact, it is powerful. The most powerful choice we can make is to choose love, to choose to unite, to choose empathy, to choose inclusion, to choose to create a world where you can be sure your brothers and sisters are safe, just like Evan and Jay are safe at Ponagansett High School. So I'll stop there and uh, invite Tammy or Anne or others who have access to the chat or to chats to jump in and challenge or redirect the conversation or, uh, or add to these ideas. Hey, Tim, I'm actually gonna ask you a question. We have about five minutes. Okay. So we're just gonna do this one. Um, the question that came in is the solutions that you've mentioned are things that we've taught or taught in elementary and high school. They've been forgotten by many. Why do you think that we've lost them so quickly? Or maybe is it another problem? Do you think we're actually internalizing them at those ages? And then what is the way forward from there? Yeah. Well, I think some of the skills we were taught, but it's a more complicated world now. And the skills that we needed maybe a hundred years ago to be able to manage tension in a small town in America might've been overwhelming in some ways, uh, fear of disease, fear of hunger, fear of uh, shelter, you know, loss of shelter and stuff like that. A real serious life-changing fear of incarceration, slavery, I mean, these were not insignificant challenges 100 or 200 years ago, but they're different than the challenges we have right now. Right now, we're in a smaller planet. It's hotter. It's denser. We have a renewed sense that everybody should belong. We are not as willing to tolerate the injustices of the past, which is a good thing. But that means we've got to come up with new solutions. So in some ways, we know these skills but in some ways we need to deploy them completely differently. Uh, and in the old times, there were many things that were different. A lot of people ask this question, what's changed? Why has things gotten to be, you know, um, there are a lot of reasons why I think how, frankly, there's a sense of really spiritual despair. I think some of our, uh, some of our anxiety is existential uh, that we're worried. Maybe we're just meaningless uh, small creatures in a meaningless universe. Um, at its core, the failure of our religious and spiritual institutions to infuse the culture with new, more powerful manifestations of their own teachings, I would venture to say, uh, is a challenge of now. It's not that we need to relearn empathy or love. It's that we need to redeploy them. And we can't just do this at home. This can't just be a self-improvement country. It's got to be an us improvement strategy. So uh, how do we talk about choosing love in schools or in businesses or in politics, most people would think you'd get laughed out of a political, uh, out of a legislature if you went into a caucus room and said, let's all stop here, turtle and then choose love. But I gotta tell you, uh, if I were on the Hill right now with Republicans and Democrats fighting over uh, the, the dimensions of the relief packages that they're debating, that's what I would wanna see them do. First turtle, and then listen to Scarlett for a moment about how to choose love and then presume positive intent and then see what might happen. I bet you we'd get a better solution. So some of these things are old, but they need new, uh, new wineskins, if I can use that, uh, uh, that metaphor. Perfect, thank you so much, Tim, for answering that question. We just wanna thank you again for coming and speaking with us, sharing your passion and for your team as well, for helping us out. Um, I just wanna remind everyone um, that we have some social media pages that you can follow for Tim. And if you want to get to know more about right. him and how you can participate in these solutions, we have Unite at The Call to Unite. Um, you can follow him on Instagram at Timothy Shriver, on Facebook at Tim Shriver, and you can also visit his website, www.unite.us. So thank you for tuning in, you guys, and we'll see you at the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah.